Good morning. Uh, this is Andy Fan from Yahoo. I think through all the talk, uh, you guys have heard a lot of story about the Yarn enables the different type of applications available on Hadoop stack. In this morning, my friend Amos gave you guys a brief overview about how the machine learning, you know, is uh, play a big role at Yahoo as well, right? So in this talk, I will try to focus on Spark on Yarn. That is a, a component available for you from the various uh, Spark releases. You could download from Apache, or you get whatever the distribution channel you are having, right? And in this talk, we will we will first start with a brief overview about the Spark, so that everybody on the same page. Then we will dive deep, slightly deep into the Spark on Yarn internals, and also uh, try to explain from a user perspective how you use the Spark on Yarn. Then I think I will try to expand from the use case uh, Amos was mentioning for the machine learning. I will give you some more additional examples about you know, how, the, how, you know, how you really do the machine learning on this, uh, using this uh, Spark stuff. OK, so we will start with the brief overview of the Spark. So what is Spark anyway, right? Spark is a distributed computing system that is uh, compatible with uh, Hadoop. So compatible with Hadoop, on the other hand, it comes with several key advantages. One, I think, is the outline there is the, is the speed, and the second is the expressiveness of the things. So the, from the speed point of view, there are two main drivers for this Spark enable your Spark application to be slightly faster. One is the, it is uh, designed to be for the more general, uh, general execution graph, comparing with the limited map reduce thing, right? And the second is uh, come with the built-in support for the in-memory storage. So as a result, you could avoid some unnecessary I/O operations uh, that when you deal with your big data sets. Then the, I think the beauty of the Spark to me is uh, in its usability. Right? It is designed to have a very simple ways enable you to manipulate the large data sets through uh, some simple yet very rich API. I will walk through a few examples with you later. Then the other side is it comes with some like interactive shares so that you could perform the interactive analysis of your data sets. Then from the user point of view, actually it's uh, enable you to run your Spark application in kind of, you know, several different ways you could do, right? You could using your launch, you, you found a few machines you have at hand, you know, set up your Spark cluster if you decide to. On the other hand, for the folks who already have sources, the cluster available for you, like a Hadoop cluster, Mesos clusters, then you could simply run your Spark application on those clusters. Even better, if you, you know, just wanted to use using some cloud services, you know, go to Amazon, you will be able to run those things. So, see, for, in order to, understand a little bit more, let me explain some of the basic concepts of Spark. End of the day, Spark has a very one single concept that one needed to understand, called the resilient uh, distributed data sets, or we simply call it RDD. I think in some several talk, you guys heard like RDD, RDD, right? So RDD is a very simple concept and it is for the collection of objects that are going to say uh, disk you know, distributed across our clusters. So you could imagine, you know, your log, log files or your, you know, your lots of different kind of data sets you could, you could model as RDDs. And then the RDD comes with some simple APIs enable you to perform the 
parallel transformations. I will give you some example later. Then the one of this important thing for the RDD give to you is the building support for the failure handlings. Because once you do the, your big data sets, you try to do, do lots of manipulations, such as machine learning, you know, you, you could take a while to finish your job. During that period, some of your nodes or some of your process may fail, right? And what Spark enables you to do is that all those failures will become invisible to you. Because the RDD definition itself enables the system to rebuild those data by itself. Then the other side is for the speed point of view that enable you to control where you want to keep those RDDs for your processes. So in the nutshell, Spark program is to perform the transformations and action against those RDD. So here is the as an example, right? So let's just say imagine you have a log file in the HDFS. You want to try to, you know, uh, look into your log file, try to do some uh, to find some information, right? So then, first thing you're going to do is using the Spark create a context that in here I just call the Spark. And in it, from there, you say, you know, let me construct the RDD for my HDFS files. So you have this thing I call the line. Then from there, you know, you'll be able to perform the various transformations. So first thing, let's say, you know, let's uh, just on the look into the error lines of the from your log. So what you're going to do is apply a transformation operator called a filter against your RDD called the line then give a, you know, um, give a, a, a function logically. Say, you know, let me find the line, start with the error. So you have those error lines. Now then you have the error line, now you could not say, you know, let me only look into the ma error message itself. Again, there's another operator called the map. From there you give another, you know, functions. You say, okay, let me form those, the, look, look at the, uh, tabs, you know, the third tab in my error message, you know, from there I have the error message. Now you have the data, you know, you're thinking, I'm going to do this process for a while, so let me bring that thing into in memory, right? So you de declare, you say, okay, let me put all the message in cache, in memory, right? Now once I have that, now the beauty over there is say, now you have the data there, now you say, I'm going to do some job, right? Then instead of like the, Spark defines some APIs. They basically say, you know, you have a Scala. Go ahead and using your Scala or Java, whatever the language primitives to do your job. So here I'm using the for loop logic you're going to look along it. Right? So you're going to say, okay, if I have a for loop and then in it I'm going to say, here's a set of the keywords I'm going to look into it. So here now, Logic and now with the message RDDs, I'm performing the transformation. You, again, I'm using filter to find the line with as uh, the error message with set keyword and do the counting, right? So you imagine, you know, you could, my follow loop could be running out for a while or do whatever the other thing you wanted to do. From this, that's basically our, you know, log analysis of in Spark. And in, as you could see here, you know, it does not need to worry about all the distributed systems and does not worry about the failure stuff. And the, the, the program language is safe, is so, you know, the API is so simple, just the work. And to make this thing more interesting is the a set of the project has been built on top of the Spark core. And some of them enable you to the, uh, like the, apply some SQL operations. Some others enable you to do the graph uh, processing. Some other, you others enable you to do the machine learning stuff. So by leverage all of those, now you could combine them, all of them together, right? So now the example I'm giving here is to say, okay, let's uh, using my, from my HDFS file, I'm going to construct a, a RDD called a twist. And with that trees, I'm going to do a SQL statement to find the latitude and the longitude uh, from those trees. Once I have that, I call the points as the RDD here. 
Now, what's, uh, once I have these points as RDD there, it's like you know, thinking about a big matrix over there, right? Now you say, now let me apply a machine learning algorithm called k-means to the clustering. And in the example here, I'm trying to find the 10 clusters for those points so that you know where the, you know, what's the 10 major areas, you know, how they divide those trees. As you could see, you know, by combining all those the basic Spark capabilities and those additional uh, projects on top of it, one could do a very powerful thing using Spark. So hopefully by now you will be saying, you know, let me put it into action, right? So that's why we have the Spark on Young, right? So the, the thing Spark Young, as I mentioned earlier on, Spark could be run on the different environment. For many of us, we have a Hadoop cluster at hand, so say we wanted to run those things over there. So that's what the Spark Yarn enabled us to do. So as you see, as illustrated in this diagram here, is that we wanted to enable the Spark applications and MapReduce application to run in the same cluster. You know, you do not need to separate, set up a separate cluster here anymore, right? And then from both the side of the applications, they will be have direct access to the data sets on HDFS. So very peaceful you know, environment in that cluster, it's the same data sets, so they will be manipulated, accessed by both MapReduce application and Spark applications. So you may wonder, so why, why should we do that? So here's a few reasons I wanted to make sure you understand. So first it is that as many of you do, like you have a lot of data sets available on your HDFS, right? So at Yahoo, you know, as uh, Amaz mentioned, we have you know, you know, some several petabytes of data over there, you know, just, uh, you know, we wanted to do a lot of data, you know, processing, even using our Spark program, right? So that's the one reason. And you, because if you want to, set, once you try to set up the different cluster, then you have, you have the problem of the moving that data from one cluster to another, all those, the associated costs will be associated with it. Then the second reason is the, all those, the computation, powers you would have on the Hadoop cluster, we want you to be able to leverage. So in Yahoo case, we have, you know, tens of thousands of machines sitting there in the Hadoop cluster. You know, sometimes it's really busy because the Hadoop job is running. Some other time, you know, your Spark job could be using that as well, right? And then the even better is to say, many of our, many of or or your, you know, Spark programmer users have been familiar with the Hadoop, right? So with the Spark on Yarn that, uh, that enable you to do is provide a very familiar interface for those users. Then from the company point of view, from business point of view, is uh, be able to leverage those clusters, then you do not need to pay additional deployment costs, operation costs for yet another cluster. Then the the other side of the design of the Spark Yarn is try to make your life really easy. So I will give you some example later. I mean, so with those, as those are the reasons, you know, to, to for Spark users to seriously think to leverage Spark on Yarn to do your job. And that is the reason why Yahoo has been, you know, uh, uh, working with our community to bring Spark Yarn available for everybody to use. So here's some basic features of the Spark on Yarn, right? The, the first of, I, I, I will, it has a several mode to execute your Spark applications with the Spark on Yarn. One is to run your Spark, on, uh, Spark program in your client um, uh, side. And the other is, uh, you know, to have that thing completely run on the server side. I will walk through those, those two different modes uh, in next a few slides. Then the, certainly it was designed to spark on, because it's a spark on, yeah, so it's designed to leverage all those existing uh, spark 
functionalities, such as the Spark history server. So you could run your Spark program, and then a few days later, to look into the Spark history server, to look into your log or the you know, matrix stuff as you like. Then the one of the effort of the Spark on Young project is uh, want, we want to make sure that all those the security issues will be addressed with the Spark on Young. So with the release, you, you, know, you could access the, you know, your data in your secure HDFS environment. And also we will enable you to enforce the authentications across the, your Spark uh, subsystems. And then the, for your application job files, for your Spark uh, application job files, you could either put it into your local file systems or you could even put it into the HDFS uh, 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 pass. Then if you need a, a, to pass along additional data files for your, your Spark programs, you could leverage the Hadoop distributed cache. Currently, the, uh, the Spark on Yang is available on the several different releases of the Hadoop. At Yahoo, we are using the Spark on Yang on the both the Hadoop uh, 0.23 and Hadoop 2.x. <coughs> so now that you kind of have the brief views about the features, right? So now let's uh, dive deep into the architecture side so that you feel you know, it just shows that how much this thing is behind this thing has happened, is helping you to achieve your goal. So as I mentioned early on, there are the two modes of the execution of your Spark program with Spark on Young. So the first example is, is the mode, model, we, we, is the one, original one we developed called the cluster mode. In this way, in this mode, what you're going to do is using the Spark on Young client, you're going to launch your applications through our resource manager. And at, at that point, what's going to happen is that the resource manager is going to find a young containers for to on that new container, on that container, we're going to launch the Spark application master. Okay, once the application master is launched, on that same box, we're going to launch the user's Spark program. So that is your, like the driver code, logically. So the, the inside your code, you're going to have the Spark context, right? Then the, once we see your Spark context, look into the parameter associated with Spark context. Then at that point, we will know how many additional containers you will need you know, to run your job. And we also know on which node we should allocate those containers. Because you're going to try to access your HDFS file, right? So with that, we will ask the young resource manager to say, you know, give me you know, containers on those machines. Here's how many I need. So at that point, we will launch the, the Spark application master is going to turn around to launch those containers for your Spark executors. Right? So at that point, logically, you have a Spark cluster dynamically created for your applications. From that point, all your normal execution of the Spark program will take it a place. So remember, as I mentioned early on, the container was allocated based on your data files. So then all those like the RDD transformations will be performed in the locations that where those data exist. And then your application code sitting in our application matrix side will keep driving like so the for loop, all those things, make sure all your logic get executed in, this, in that distributed cluster. So after your execution, after a while, once you finish your job, then application master is going to say, you know, I finished my job. Young resource manager, here's the container I use. I no more need it. Please take it back. And then 
you know, from the at that point, everything is just getting the from the Hadoop cluster point of view, as if nothing has ever happened. And then on the other hand, there are Spark history servers or the gathered source information about your executions. Then later on, you could go to your Spark history server to see the details of the execution of your thing. That sounds complicated, right? But from the end user point of view, this is on the single line you needed to do. Using this Spark submit command to give us your Spark jar file, tell us what is the main class in that Spark in that jar file you want to be executed. And because you want to run this in cluster mode, then in the one of the parameters you're going to indicate you are using the young cluster. That's it. So with that single line of the code, you are running your Spark application in your Hadoop cluster. You do not need to find the machines. You do not worry about all the details. It should just do the magic for you. Now, this mode does come with some interesting thing. Like your, all your program is running in the, like the server allocated by our containers. So what if you want to, as a part of your program, you want to give you know, control of these things? So for that purpose, we have another mode called the client mode. The so small difference here is the, the your user program, your drivers, is running in your client side, not running on the, on the cluster side. So what does that enable you to do is uh, your program will be able to access the resources available on your local, in your client. For example, that will be you, right? If you want, imagine you want to do the interactive analysis of your data sets, right? So your, 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 your Java program is running in your client, so you, know, you could, you know, Give all those, you know, look into the things, you know, give the input to your next step of your, your interactive analysis. So on the dis from your program point of view, from your end user point of view, right, the only difference between this mode and that mode is that you just simply specify the, uh, the, in the, when you launch your application, you just need to specify the which mode you are using. So this is a master thing. So in here, you need to specify as a young client. And the, the, all the details are just you know, from the, uh, the internal details of this client mode. The model is the same as the cluster mode. OK. So, so one of the examples we'll be saying, you know, is ever there. In the, for the people who are familiar with the Spark, is ever there. Uh, uh, they have this lovely tools called the interactive shell that are enabled for our uh, Spark users or developers. So people tend to use that you know, Spark shell to learn Spark or to, to look into their data, so whatever the, you decide to do. So with the Spark, yeah, with that client mode, logically, we are enable the Spark shells enable for you. So to do that, here's the only thing you needed to do. So when you, in order to launch that thing in the Spark on Yarn, again, you just need to specify the masters, you know, you know you, you, as this young client. Then once you launch it, like or whatever the thing you want to type, do the, all your IDD transformations will happen on the machines on your Hadoop cluster. Okay, now that you launch, now you say, you know, now what I'm, what I, what, let's assume some job is running, what are you going to do? So from the Spark user point of view, they, they, just go, they could just go to your Hadoop UI to manage your Spark applications. So here's the screenshots I took the one day 
I was looking into our Yahoo uh, dashboard, you know, Hadoop dashboard. You see a bunch of the Hadoop job is running on the top over there, and then mix up then there, there's a bunch of the Spark job. So that was that. I, I remember I was keeping receiving the question from our Yahoo user community. So, you know, where is the uh, where is the Spark cluster? I said, you know, we are, there's no such thing called a Spark cluster. So there's this thing called a Hadoop cluster. Go over there, you launch your things. And then from our operative, you know, operation team point of view, they even do not know this thing ever launched because all of them just happen in their cluster. You know, just a map, logically from their point of view, some map reduce job, type job, you know, just running on that sense. Very easy, right? Then on the, for the end user, if you want to dig deep in your sense, you may want to say, you know, I wanted to really dig deep into my Spark details sense. Then what you need to do, just click one of those link over there. Then it will give your native Spark UI. Right, so then you could see all those detailed information as much as you like. So with the Spark on Yarn, what we are giving to you is the pore of both the Hadoop and the Spark, both of them in a very simple way. And there's a lot of additional features we as the dev community is uh, continue working on it. And one of the area for the enhancement is uh, to enable the long running job in running in a secure environment. So the currently one of the small limitations we have is um, so imagine you do the yeah, do the secure environment with the Kerberos, uh, you know, authentications, right? So the Kerberos tickets going to be expired, you know, after several hours, right? So at this point, we do not do any renewing of the Kerberos tickets. So the some so and then. If you imagine, say, you know, once you imagine to the long running job, there are all other stuff you may want to do. So let's just say you launch your cluster, you know, uh, Spark on Yansen, you know, this thing, your thing could be running for a few days, but during that period, you know, all the workload of your whole cluster, you know, Hadoop cluster itself may change, all those things, right? So you may want to dynamically adjust the resource utilization for your clusters. So, so, so those are the, some of those features the community is going to work on. We will be love to hear your input. So that's enough of the Spark thing. So now let me give you, make your life easier, go to the, some use case. I think this is one of the example, as Amaz mentioned in his keynote speech today for the machine learning for our native ads. So what's going on here is that at the, in our Yahoo homepage, so we have also the to today modules, and then in the below that is the main section of our page has also the streaming of the contents. And within those streaming of contents, there are the, we inserted a few ads for you. We select those ads based on users' engagement. We want to make sure they are good for you. So in order to do that, we have been busily developing machine learning algorithms. And the manner of our algorithm was developed the tradition, you know, over the years to run in the Hadoop environment. Now that we made this Spark available for our, you know, uh, research community, uh, you know, at Yahoo, then the, some of our scientists say, you know, let me try write a machine learning algorithm in Spark. So he wrote one. He wrote a logic regression algorithm for the machine learning for this thing. It turned out that he was surprised to say, you know, this thing works. Only have 100 lines of the code. Then, they, then we say, okay, why don't you give it a run to see how, how long it takes? Does it really do any, you know, learn anything with the 120 lines of the code? Then he, he used to say, okay, let it, let it, he basically using the Spark on Yarn to using the uh, 50 nodes against the 100 million training examples and with uh, a few, you know, thousand features. He did the learning, learning 30 minutes. 
with that 30 minutes, give, give him the learning result model very similar to the all traditional algorithm we have had. Our traditional algorithm was a few thousand lines of code. And for, then he was quite happy. Then he would say, you know, the thing really making me happy is this thing, it's the time to market. So we, because we, we were the, like the team was the leading this spark on young development, right? So we kind of was busy. We, we first made our thing available at Yahoo. And we, at Yahoo, we created those packages for our users. We create our package was, I think, was a 2 o'clock Friday. At 4 o'clock, I got an email from him. Say, Andy, my stuff is running. That's like, a, you know, so from a scientist's point of view, that's a kind of unbelievable, right? You usually they need to find the machines to run their things, to move in the data, all those stuff. It takes days. Now, so instead of doing that, he just finished his job in like, you know, or whatever stuff he did in that 20 minutes, you know, <laughs> just as this stuff was running. So here's another example, right? So the, another use case here, a model is still, again, is a machine learning. So we, as a part of our effort at Yahoo, is uh, try to do the mobile stuff, right? So and the mobile, you have this uh, mobile ads. And again, we want to do the machine learning here. So interesting thing for this uh, mobile search, uh, aside is the number of the features we need to look into it. So the, here we have, we have you know, typical top of 100 million uh, features for that learning sense. And then we tended to have more training examples because number of the features. So be, because we kind of, you know, in compare with the Hadoop, Spark is relatively new, right? You know, they have the, we, we are not sure with the Spark is lady for this kind of use case. Guess what? So the guy basically, you know, he has another uh, our scientist. He modified, he was working with our Berkeley guy, friends, and modified the M, you know, MLlib, that's a machine learning library on Spark, made some small enhancement, and then he was able, using Spark on Yarn, Found hundred, you know, specifies that he need hundred workers. Then finish the training in six hours. With the result, that result was very much close to the heavily man, manually turned logic regression algorithm we have had over the years. So I think another success story from our point of view. Then we, some of the details of this uh, uh, enhancement of the uh, this decision tree algorithm will be, uh, will be discussed at the upcoming Spark Summit. And before I wrap up, here's another example, right? So he, here's the, uh, so we do the advertisement, uh, your online advertisement. Many advertiser tend to, so one way advertiser tell us how, what kind of type of people they want to target is to give us the example of so their existing customers. So, you know, here's the 10,000 10, customers I have. Please find the similar customers of those nature. So, and what we do is doing the machine learning because, you know, we have millions of exam, uh, customers, right? So, we will do the machine learning to find the customer users as similar to those behaviors of those users. So we, again, we have a bunch of the machine learning pipelines to do that purpose. And then one day, you know, the team decided, you know, we heard enough about the Spark. Let's give it a try. But on the one hand, I, I'm not going to, he say, you know, I'm not going to try to, to touch my details of my training pipelines. I, I have this thing in C++, looks beautiful but I want to use and try the Spark to see does it make any difference for me or not. So what he really did here is uh, transition from the Hadoop streaming to the thing called the Spark pipe. Using your, what he enabled him to do using existing code and migrate on the Spark. 
it's the benefits for him, though, then we suddenly know that nothing's going to happen, right? Just going to do the same thing. Guess what? The benefits for him was the thing, the end-to-end -end training time was reduced to 50%. So they said, as an illustrated, some of the underlying design for this spark does give you some, you know, interesting speed up comparing with, you know, uh, with Hadoop in some of the specific use case. So anyway, those are the, a few examples from Yahoo point of view. We believe Spark is a useful uh, platform for the machine learning and some of the related things. We continue to believe Hadoop is the you know, cornerstone of our big data platform, but Spark is a nice, very nice thing for us. With that, I think I wanted to thank the, all the contributors in the Spark on Young uh, side. They have the, our friends in the Berkeley side, and we have several contributors from Yahoo played important roles for these things. Recently, we are welcoming the additional contributor from the Cloud Data and uh, the other team. And this is, again, as I mentioned earlier on, Spark on Young is available for you. And you know, it, you, you could give it, you should definitely give it a try. Some companies such as the Alibaba, they already put that thing into their production. They wrote some you know, nice block. You could, if you, if you lead Chinese, you could find them. Hopefully, some days we have some English version of their blog about how wonderful Spark on Young is. And so, I, anyway, so that's a kind of my quick uh, overview about the Spark on Young and how Yahoo is using Spark on Young to, uh, you know, enable the machine learning type of things. As many others, we are hiring. So, if you want to uh, give me your resume and we will give you a test of this Scala or something, if we pass that test, we hire you. Any questions? Hi. Hey. So, so, I wonder uh, is that possible to use Spark within Storm? Uh, mm. uh, not really. I do not know. And it's kind of interesting why. I just wonder why you wanted to do that. Uh, it's kind of like an online uh, updating the, the machine learning model. So. Okay. I mean, you could do the, so as uh, Amaz mentioned in his slide, we are doing the real-time machine learning. So we're using Storm. But what we do is say, in source Storm code, you j whatever your machine learning algorithm, you should be able to just put it into the Storm. You do not need a Spark for that purpose. Because at the end of the day, the Spark is designed for batch processing, Storm is designed for real-time event processing. OK, thanks. Any other questions? Everybody is hungry? Go ahead. Thank you for the talk. Uh, just can you give a few words um, about your uh, benefits, uh, disadvantages of using Spark on Mesos versus Spark on Yarn? I think I'm I'm not the right person to answer that question because I'm very much biased. Because <laughs> I mean, the, really about the community we have between the young community and the Mesos community, right? I think the Mesos community, I was very, very small. I, I remember I was having a conversation with our friend in Twitter the other day. I was telling him, you know, you should just give up. I think, you know, I, I, you know, you could certainly give it a try on the Spark on Mesos. I think at this point, I would say Spark on Young is, uh, you know, especially for the people who have Hadoop clusters. There's no reason you want to Spark, you know, try the other things. But on the one hand, if you, you know, you just already have the Mesos clusters, if so, then please use Mes uh, Spark Mesos. From the Spark programming point of view, they, do not, they should not make any difference. Any other questions? Well, um, are you now using your Spark as in-memory computing only? I mean, the, the, are you doing the ETL with Spark? N no. I mean, uh -huh. we, say, we believe is the, 
uh, the Hadoop is good for many of generic things, like yeah. you know, a pig. I think we, I think you guys must have heard some of the talk we have, we giving out on the pig or things, right? Yeah. We believe like a pig for ETL sounds wonderful. Okay, so you are using the pig on test yeah. as our ETL tool and Spark as our in-memory computing, right? Yeah, we, we basically running. believe yeah. the Spark is uh, good for the certain set of the use case. Yeah. I think that as an example, I'm giving all the here today, all of them data for machine learning. Yeah. For the, if you want to do the iterative processing, I think Spark is a wonderful thing. Uh -huh. And if you just want to do a very simple, you know, a flow things, uh, you know, you, you, you could play with the Spark, and then maybe it does not, you know, not necessarily give you the best, you know, all the benefit. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry, we have to break for lunch. Okay, we'll take offline. Thank you all. <laughs>